This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. White Fang by Jack London Part 5 Chapter 1 The Long Trail It was in the air. White Fang sensed the coming calamity even before there was tangible evidence of it. In vague ways it was borne in upon him that a change was impending. He knew not how nor why, yet he got his feel of the oncoming event from the gods themselves. In ways subtler than they knew, they betrayed their intentions to the wolf-dog that haunted the cabin stoop, and that, though he never came inside, the cabin knew what went on inside their brains. "'Listen to that, will you?' the dog-musher exclaimed at supper one night. Weedon Scott listened. Through the door came a low, anxious whine, like a sobbing under the breath that had just grown audible. Then came the long sniff, as White Fang reassured himself that his god was still inside and had not yet taken himself off into the mysterious and solitary flight. "'I do believe that wolf's on to you,' the dog-musher said." Weedon Scott looked across at his companion with eyes that almost pleaded, though this was given the lie by his words. "'What the devil can I do with a wolf in California?' he demanded. "'That's what I say,' Matt answered. "'What the devil can you do with a wolf in California?' But this did not satisfy Weedon Scott. The other seemed to be judging him in a non-committal sort of way. White man's dog would have no show against him, Scott went on. He'd kill them on sight. If he didn't bankrupt me with damage suits, the authorities would take him away from me and electrocute him. He's a downright murderer, I know, was the dog musher's comment. Whedon Scott looked at him suspiciously. It would never do, he said decisively. It would never do, Matt concurred. Why, you'd have to hire a man special to take care of him. The other's suspicion was allied. He nodded cheerfully. In the silence that followed, the low, half-sobbing whine was heard at the door, and then the long, questing sniff. "'There's no denying he thinks a hell of a lot of you,' Matt said. The other glared at him in sudden wrath. "'Damn it all, man! I know my own mind and what's best. I'm agreeing with you. Only—only only what? Only—' The dog-musher began softly, then changed his mind and betrayed a rising anger of his own. "'Well, you needn't get all fired up and heated about it. Judging by your actions, one think you didn't know your own mind.' Whedon Scott debated with himself for a while, and then said more gently, "'You're right, Matt. I don't know my own mind, and that's what's the trouble.' "'Why, it would be rank ridiculous for me to take that dog along,' he broke out after another pause. "'I'm agreeing with you,' was Matt's answer, and again his employer was not quite satisfied with him. "'But how in the name of the great Sardanopolis he knows you're going is what gets me,' the dog-musher continued innocently. "'It's beyond me, Matt,' Scott answered, with a mournful shake of the head. "'Then came the day when, through the open cabin door, White Fang saw the fateful grip on the floor, and the love master packing things into it. Also, there were comings and goings, and the erstwhile placid atmosphere of the cabin was vexed with strange perturbations and unrest. Here was indubitably evidence. White Fang had already scented it. He now reasoned it. His god was preparing for another flight, and since he had not taken him with him before, so now he could look to be left behind. That night he lifted the long wolf howl, as he howled in his puppy days, when he had fled back from the wild to the village to find it vanished, and not but a rubbish heap to mark the site of Grey Beaver's teepee. So now he pointed his muzzle to the cold stars and told them his woe. Inside the cabin two men had just gone to bed. "'He's gone off his food again,' Matt remarked from his bunk. "'There was a grunt from Weedon Scott's bunk and a stir of blankets. "'From the way he cut up the other time you went away, "'I wouldn't wonder this time but what he died.' "'The blanket in the other bunk stirred irritably. "'Oh, shut up!' 
Scott cried out through the darkness. You nag worse than a woman. I'm agreeing with you, the dog musher answered, and Weedon Scott was not quite sure whether or not he had snickered. The next day, White Fang's anxiety and restlessness were even more pronounced. He dogged his master's heels whenever he left the cabin, and haunted the front stoop when he remained inside. Through the open door he could catch glimpses of the luggage on the floor. The grip had been joined by two large canvas bags and a box. Matt was rolling the master's blankets and fur robes inside a small tarpaulin. White Fang whined as he watched the operation. Later on, two Indians arrived. He watched them closely as they shouldered the luggage and were led off down the hill by Matt, who carried the bedding and the grip. But White Fang did not follow them. The master was still in the cabin. After a time, Matt returned. The master came to the door and called White Fang inside. "'You poor devil,' he gently said, rubbing White Fang's ears and tapping his spine. "'I'm hitting the long trail, old man, where you cannot follow. "'Now give me a good growl, the last goodbye growl.' But White Fang refused to growl. Instead, after a wistful, searching look, he snuggled in, burrowed his head out of sight between the master's arms and body. "'There she blows!' Matt cried. From the Yukon arose the hoarsest bellowing of a river steamboat. "'You've got to cut it short. Be sure to lock the front door. I'll go out the back. Get a move on!' The two doors slammed at the same moment, and Weedon Scott waited for Matt to come around the front. From inside the cabin door, a low whining and sobbing. Then there was long, deep-drawn sniffs. You must take good care of him, Matt, Scott said as they started down the hill. Write me and let me know how he gets along. Sure, the dog musher answered. But listen to that, will ya? Both men stopped. White Fang was howling as dogs howl when their masters lie dead. He was voicing an utter woe, his cries bursting upward in great heartbreaking rushes dying down into quivering misery and bursting up where again with a rush upon rush of grief. The Aurora was the first steamboat of the year for the outside, and her decks were jammed with prosperous adventurers and broken gold seekers, all equally as mad to get to the outside as they had been originally to get to the inside. Near the gangplank, Scott was shaking hands with Matt, who was preparing to go ashore. But Matt's hands went limp in the other's grasp as his gaze shot past and remained fixed on something behind him. Scott turned to see. Sitting on the deck, several feet away, and watching wistfully, was White Fang. The dog musher swore softly in awe-struck in accents. Scott could only look in wonder. "'Did you lock the front door?' Matt demanded. The other nodded and asked, "'How about the back?' "'You bet I did,' was the fervent reply. "'White Fang flattened his ears in gratingly, "'but remained where he was, making no attempt to approach. "'I'll have to take him ashore with me.' "'Matt made a couple of steps towards White Fang, "'but the latter slid away from him. "'The dog musher made a rush of it, "'and White Fang dodged between the legs of a group of men. "'Ducking, turning, doubling, he slid about the deck, "'eluding the other's efforts to capture him.' But when the love master spoke, White Fang came to him with prompt obedience. "'Won't come to the hand that feed him all these months,' the dog musher muttered resentfully. "'And you, you ain't never fed him after the first day of getting acquainted. I'm blamed if I can see how he worked out that you're the boss.' Scott, who had been patting White Fang, suddenly bent closer and pointed out fresh-made cuts on his muzzle and a gash between the eyes. Matt bent over and passed his hand along White Fang's belly. "'We plumb forgot about the window. He's all cut up and gouged underneath. Must have butted clean through it, by gosh!' But Weedon Scott was not listening. He was thinking rapidly. The Aurora's whistle hooted a final announcement of departure. Men were scurrying down the gangplank to the shore. Matt loosened the bandana from his own neck and started to put it around White Fang's. Scott grasped the dog musher's hands. Goodbye, mad old man. 
about the wolf. You needn't write. You see, I've... What? The dog musher exploded. You don't mean to say... The very thing I mean. Here's your bandana. I'll write you about him. Matt paused halfway down the gangplank. He'll never stand the climate, shouted back, unless you clip him in the warm weather. The gangplank was hauled in, and the aurora swung out from the bank. Whedon Scott waved a last goodbye. Then he turned and bent over White Fang, standing by his side. Now growl, damn you, growl, he said as he patted the responsive head and rubbed the flattening ears. End of Part 5, Chapter 1